And I'm going to introduce our panel. So grateful that Tara and Nate have come down from Humboldt to be here with us today and share their knowledge of what has been going on in Humboldt. Tara is the executive director of the Humboldt County Growers Alliance and is also a board of directors for the California Growers Association. Uh, Tara was involved in Humboldt's uh, um, ordinance in 2015, helped shape the ordinance that produced a progressive land use ordinance which was approved unanimously by their Board of Supervisors in 2016. In early 2016. Uh, Tara's doing phenomenal work on the advocacy front in Humboldt, bringing um, uh, the advocacy efforts together, so hosting workshops, so thank you, Tara. And Nate is, I'm just gonna say Nate, and you're gonna go right into it, but Nate is, is one of the, uh, out of the 20 uh, permit holders in county, I might be wrong, maybe it's 19 or 21, Nate holds uh, one of those permitting um, permitting licenses, per uh, permits, excuse me, uh, cultivation permits. So we're really excited to hear from you. And I think Hezekiah, you're going to be coming up to moderate this. So <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to you. Surprise. Awesome. Um, this is a, a last minute decision here. So um, I think. That, so, you know, the goal here for me, first and foremost, is twofold. Um, one, Humboldt County is permitted, and that's super cool. Or, well, 20 of 2,300 applications have been processed. Uh, yeah, 20 out of the 2,300. So, like, on the one hand, I think what we can take away from this panel today is that, like, just getting that ordinance in place doesn't make everything better. There's still a lot that comes afterwards. And secondly, I also want to make sure that as we're talking about Humboldt County's process, we don't assume that, hey, it worked in Humboldt. Ta-da, we can do this here in Nevada County. Um, there's a lot of differences between the two counties. And so trying to, you know, take what these two have done and what their community has done, their supervisors have done, but make, keep it relevant here for what is a very different county. Um, I'm just gonna give a couple objective points about the differences between the counties. 975 square miles of land mass here in Nevada County. 4,700 in Humboldt County. 150,000 people in Humboldt, about 90,000 in Nevada County. Um, very different ownership pattern. Consolidated geology, meaning your mountains don't fall apart quite as easily as our mountains do. Um, significantly higher rates of erosion out there. In fact, the Yellow River Basin has the highest erosion rates of any basin in the Continental 48. Um, big government progressive county, where Humboldt County, like the, the really hands-on government, Property rights aren't really a major theme, although in the last eight years, I would say that the Humboldt Coalition for Property Rights has really emerged, and frankly, that was a big part of why you guys got an ordinance passed. But Nevada County is a smaller government, slightly more libertarian. Property rights are a lot more key out here. And so while there's a lot that you can learn from these two, I also like to caution everybody against assuming that there's a cut and paste option. Um, a bit of history. For those who don't know, California was a republic long before it was a state. The way that our republic was constituted was through bringing a network of city-states together into a federation. That is why our local control provisions run so deep, is because we actually were a network of city-states prior to being a state, well, prior to being a republic, prior to being a state of the union. And so local control is something we gripe a lot about, but it reflects real fundamental historic differences in culture and in the way we're governed. And so all a very long-winded way of saying they're gonna give you a lot of really useful information, but you're gonna have to make it work here on your own. And so with that, let's do some intros. Tara, you start, who are you? Why should folks care? And then Nate will do the same. Hi, um, I'm Tara Carver. And I just want to say how thankful I am for being here. I've been tracking your guys' progress, and it is definitely progress. And you're my crush county, and I hope you crush it. So from Humboldt with love. Um, my name is Tara Carver, born and raised in Humboldt County. I've been in the industry for about 15 years, primarily on production, um, growing in very rural areas. Uh, I saw a big need with a bunch of other folks like Nate in 
2014, as the state started talking about moving forward with Hezekiah up on, in Sacramento, that we needed as a county to move forward as well. Um, we formed a group. Uh, we decided we were going to run an initiative, and we were going to get after it. And that was difficult. And so we pivoted to listening to a lot of stakeholders in our community, and it was very much apparent that um, public process was the right way for our county to go forward. Um, I'm, again, this is just a humble perspective. I'm not recommending any which way with you folks, but um, in 2015, we handed over our ordinance to the county. We went through an aggressive public process. So time out, Tara. Oh, sorry. We handed over our ordinance oh. to the county. That sounds really backward outside of Humboldt County. Usually yeah. the county gives the ordinance to the public. Can you explain yeah. what you so, mean by we so handed an we ordinance? We as, as the industry and a group had written an initiative and we had outlined how we thought the rules should be made and that we were going to gather signatures and we were going to put an initiative or uh, ordinance together. Um, when I say we handed it over, we discussed with the county, other stakeholder groups that public <coughs> process would be a better way. And so we formally presented our ordinance, asked them to create one. They cordially agreed. And so we went down the, the road of, of true public process. And when I look back a few years or so later, I, it was the right thing to do for us. Um, it really highlighted some issues that we did not address or didn't see. And uh, while it was an aggressive timeline, because by then the state had determined that there was a deadline to get an ordinance, which has now since been lifted, Humboldt County, we went fast and furious. And when I mean that, we were in planning commission and board of supervisors meetings for six months straight. Some of them included five or six nights a week. It was incredible. So it was a great effort on local government, industry, and stakeholders to come together and the general public. Um, and I think we produced a pretty good ordinance. Now, what we didn't quite, well, we're not, we don't have magic eight balls that tell us what's going to happen up in Sacramento. And so while developing this ordinance, we, we didn't have the tools that you guys have now to kind of see how the state's going to move. And so we embedded a couple things into our process that's really holding us up. Um, we also came under litigation and the county decided to settle um, that litigation that basically froze our ordinance. And so right now it's not an organic process, whereas we run into problems, we can fix them. We're just basically stalled out. And so we're having a little bit of trouble with some of the finer details of what we, and we, as I say, as that stakeholder and local government and public process developed um, that's holding us up. Nate has done an incredible job and worked really hard and been on it every single day to get where he's at. And um, at home, we're, we're reforming groups now and coming together and trying to figure out how we're gonna move forward. Um, but that was, a, that was a lot of talking uh, without specific points. Um, so I don't know how deep you wanna get into the, the, the details of what's working for us, and I think maybe that'd be more of a question and answer time. But I do just wanna send some hope out to you, send in as much inspiration your way as I can, keep going, don't stop, work together, listen to other people, and the, the, the more that you present in a professional manner your needs and the needs of your environment and the needs of your community, eventually people will start listening. Uh, well, thanks for having me. My name is Nathan Whittington. Um, I, I went to Humboldt State University. It was my third undergraduate. I was a career uh, philosophy and uh, religious religion major. Uh, worked out great for a lot of years. I was able to extend my college rugby eligibility to an eighth year, which is really cool. Um, but then, you know, uh, I really started to get concerned about environmental issues in Humboldt County, and I decided, you know, it's, it's fun to talk about things, but you really need to be about it. So I went off to law school, got a degree in environmental law. Uh, I'm not an attorney. I do not hold myself out as such, but I am a paralegal, and I work at a law firm on compliance issues like this. Um, the biggest thing uh, we've been looking at in Humboldt is really a lot of the myth about the name. You know, it's such a loaded word, Humboldt County, weed, all that stuff, right? Well, that was a big impetus for the county moving so quickly on an ordinance and being able to mobilize people. But it was also a hurdle at the same time because everybody's so entrenched in their core little group values and their little ideas and notions. And getting everyone unified to get to a common voice where we can all work together and talk to our neighbors and actually be open about this 
that was a lot of work. And thanks to people like Hezekiah, we were able to overcome a lot of those hurdles. But really, you know, why are we here today? You guys want to know how we did it and what you need to do to do it, right? And when I, you know, we started talking to a lot of these panels early on, and I'd go into the long list of how you got to track your ownership, how you got to deal with your water rights, how you got to deal with the application and all this. And, and at the very end, everybody, the first question is, okay, so wait, what do I do again? <laughs> right? So I get that. And my, the way I've been able to, I guess, engage people on this and help you move it forward is like, let's be real. You wouldn't be in this industry if you weren't good at something. Maybe you're good at cutting a clone. Maybe you're good at putting water on plants. I'm not very good at putting water on plants. I have people who deal with that. But you're good at something, right? The key exercise, this is about baby steps here. The key exercise is go home and write down what you're really good at, your system, your techniques, your operating procedure, your in and outs. Guess what? You just got the first section of your binder done. Great. Now you can find out what the other parts are. By the way, this is my uh, zoning clearance binder for my county permit. I judge binder, I judge permits by weight now. Um, but so that's really the key is we got to get our minds around this document creating process, right? Create generating our operating procedures, our reports, our all the things that they're going to want to see for compliance. And I think once we get over that cognitive gap, the parts are going to fall in line really quickly. And you know, you asked about needs and wants. I want a permit, but I need to be a good steward of my land. And in order for me to be able to do that is I have to comply with the rules in front of me and I have to make sure I take care of my partner and I take care of my community. And then hopefully this will mesh together into a nice, easy, well-run industry in 10 years. Awesome. Um, someday. So, I, Nate, I love that. We didn't rehearse this, but um, your compliance, uh, write down your core competencies, core skills, is the exact same as the first step when we do the marketing work that, workshop, write down your core values. And so there really is this idea of identifying what your strengths are and finding others to complement the, the less strong areas. Um, goodness gracious, where to start with the two of you? There is so much about your process that is valuable here and so much that is utterly not. Um, so Nevada County uh, recently contracted with a consulting firm, which is going to take the lead on a community input and stakeholder process. I've heard them described as mediators, though technically their contract says nothing about mediation. <laughs> They're facilitators. Nonetheless, their tensions are high here, right? And there's a lot of people with entrenched differences of opinion. We definitely face that at home too. Um, advice for this facilitated process, sitting down at the table with everyone at a table and moving through things quickly, what can our community, our constituency do as they approach that to, to be received most effectively? Because you guys spun your tires for a while before you got traction, so maybe some do's and don'ts. Uh, definitely do your homework. Do not walk into a meeting unprepared. If you don't provide valid information, you will immediately become the person that doesn't know anything. And so take the time to do your due diligence. Um, two, be professional. Remember, you're, we're, we're all humans. We all belong here and we all have needs and wants. And respect each other. Don't, you know, like don't, don't be rude. Don't interrupt people. Ask questions. I think that's been what I've been most successful at um, at home is, wh well, why does that matter to you? How can we do that better? Can you explain that a little bit more? You know, just generally mine for information with people who you don't agree with because you may actually agree with them, they just might be able, not expressing it the correct way. Same, same for you. Reiterate yourself in a respectful manner with intelligent information over and over and over. Talking points are really good too. This is something that we struggled for a year and a half on this. Find those, those core things and stick to them. Don't deviate off of those during, during those meetings. Also agendas, basic agendas. Learn how to write them. Learn how to follow them. Don't be the person that breaks the agenda. Nobody likes it. So those are some, some basics. <laughs> 
I think some of the, the do's and don'ts really uh, bring us back to the rules of engagement. You know, rules when you're dealing with different groups, uh, government organizations, city officials, county officials, other industries, you know. Uh, our farm is down in the Ferndale Valley. We are a lot like Clint Eastwood for a few dollars more. We have the dairy farmers on one side of us and the petroleum family on the other. And, huh? Petroleum and rancher. Petroleum and ranchers. We are right in the middle of all the big boys, right? And we, and girls, and we came out pretty outspoken right away. And, you know, somebody in here earlier was asking about the uh, small farms and what's going to happen to them in this whole movement. We purposely went after a cottage industry 2,500 square foot operation on our farm, even though with our zone and our ag exclusive and all that, we could be much larger. We wanted to really show and prove the point that, you know, the mom and pops, the small people, we really have a say and we can really do this, you know. So being outspoken and being good neighbors was really step one, knowing our neighbors, being able to talk to them. And, you know, early on, I reached out to one of the heads of the uh, Dairy Farmers Association, and I invited him over to the house, and we were sitting on my front porch. You know, we do a lot of talks on our front porch in my house. And rather than me trying to tell him what I want, I asked him, what does he need? You know, what matters to him? How does he deal with regulation? I was like, you're an organic dairy farmer. I bet you have some regulations. Oh, yeah. I was like, do you have any binders? He says, I have 21 binders. He knew exactly how many binders and what exactly they go to. I was like, wow, can I see your binders? I, I want to you know, understand what this is about. But now, all of a sudden, we're talking about how our industries relate to one another, how we need to compartmentalize our programs going forward, and how we can work together. And now they're starting to provide me with compost from their farms. We're working together and we're starting to see a great, you know, community building environment, whereas before we couldn't even talk about it. So being able to talk about it, talk about it efficiently and understand who you're talking to. Talk to them and ask questions that engage them rather than telling them what you want, is what I would have to say. So I'm going to take my moderator's privilege and, and highlight those two things there. First and foremost, in my experience, the number one thing that our constituency lacks is credibility. Nobody believes anything we say because we have a tendency to say things without, object without proving them and demonstrating them. And so one thing that Humboldt did, there were a number of iterations of false starts and false attempts, but you finally got it down to objectively true basic points, and you don't deviate from that. It really doesn't help to go tell anybody how you feel because then you open up the gateway of how they're feeling and the dairy ranchers in the lower Yale River Valley don't feel good about pot. They do now, now that we're over that hurdle, some of them, but, but some of them. But, and, then, and then the second one is ask questions. And you know, this is something that I know I've worked with the Alliance leadership on, but like, Figure out every single reason why they say what they say. You know what's way more important than what you came to the meeting to say? Leaving knowing why they said what they said. Because that allows you to move past it. Um, and, you know, Nate, you, you accidentally hit on the wants and needs. Um, last point for me before giving it back to you guys. There's a lot of folks in our communities that want us to go away. They have ever since I was born. This, this culture conflict that we've been dealing with is generations deep. They want us to go away, but they need us to be good neighbors. They need us to keep our runoff out of the creek. They need us to keep our dogs on our, all the you know, basic things. And so it's sort of the same thing. I think there's some folks in our community who want weed to be everywhere and who want weed to be the cure-all, et cetera. Sorry for using the slang term. Um, but at the end of the day, we don't need all of those things. And so we kind of do have to find this common medium. We're way more comfortable with our own feelings and wants. We haven't necessarily done the best job of figuring out the other side. You guys are doing a tremendous job lately, though. And yes, I'm pointing at you, Diane. I'm not pointing at somebody behind you. <laughs> Who are you I'm, talking I'm, to? I'm actually going to jump on yeah, that, yeah, too. Just, just I, I hope, and I'm just going to plug this in for a minute, how incredible, tell you how incredible, you probably already know, I don't want to tell you, sorry. Your executive director here is amazing. She is, it, con, what's that? Okay, 
I've, I've just worked with Diana for the last couple of months, and she's been reaching out to Humboldt. Jonathan, you're amazing. As I mean, I'm sure you guys are all amazing. Again, you're my crush county, so by default, you've got to be incredible. Um, but, you know, Diana's reaching out. We're, it's now starting to get evidence, too, that regulation is the only pathway forward to build um, a better system. And so Diana's reached out to me and asked for numbers, water board enrollment. You know, Humboldt County, we passed an ordinance. We have the most water board enrollments in any other county, I think probably all of them combined. Um, which means that on the ground right now, what we're doing is providing a benefit to our environment. That, I mean, you can't deny that. And it's objective. And it's objective because we have data and evidence now. And so the experiment is happening here in our county and your executive director is reaching out and supplying that information back to your county. And that's what this state organization and this executive director has set up. And so I just wanna just do a whoop whoop to, to it's working. <laughs> you know, so the other thing that we did, Nate, sorry, the other thing we did in Humboldt before we had those real objective data to draw from, we asked everybody to tell us all about their farm before people felt at all safe identifying. I mean, back in 14, before we even had state law, we made them tell us how much water they were using, where it was coming from, how much it cost. And like, sometimes we grumble and blah, blah, blah. I don't want to put my name in my parcel number. Oh, well, then you don't want to be a regulated farmer. If you're going to be a permitted regulated grower, all of that information is going to be on a piece of paper. And guess what? It's going to be public. If you're not ready for it, oh well, don't be a regulated farmer. And so the more you can proactively front load that gathering of objective data, the more that your leadership are going to be empowered to actually move the needle to get to where you want. And so it's this catch-22. You're terrified. I know. There's a sheriff, etc. It's really scary. That's been true in every county we started in. There's always been a sheriff, and the sheriff always likes to cut down our plants. The only way to get over that hurdle is to behave as though they don't. Your turn. Oh, no. Nate. No, I'm just going to say, our, sh our sheriff now high fives us. <laughs> well, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, the objective data part and the fears that that raises in us, you know. Um, we've been cultivating. I mean, Hezekiah is a third-generation cultivator. There's a lot of intellectual property and techniques and secrets that go into how we do our things and create our medicine. And a lot of the fears of regulation and coming out and writing it all down on paper is that, oh, great, they're going to steal it and then D'Angelo is going to go replicate it in the valley, right? That's a legitimate fear. Well, the reality is when we all band together and we all work together and we start gathering our objective water use data soil use data and all that, we can really help drive the conversation. And in that driving of the conversation, we can still protect ourselves and our special recipes, secrets, interests. Um, a good example of this is I was, uh, we did a pilot program up in Humboldt County for track and trace this last year, right? And our farm was one of the participants in the program. And in that, we had the ag department out to my property along with the vendor uh, group that we worked with. And they asked the question, well, what does track and trace really look like? And so we're sitting here in my big hoop house, and I looked down the road, and I said, well, you see all those corn stalks over there? Does he put plant tags on his corn? I don't think so. I was like, well, what do they do for that? What do they have to report? How, do, how does the ag department deal with this? And that's when our ad commissioner says, well, it's pretty basic. They put in a production declaration. They say how big it is, how much they expect to yield. And then they give us a crop report at the end. I was like, well, that sounds great. It doesn't sound like I have to tell you all my secrets and techniques, but it still captures all of the objective information that you want. Why don't we flesh out this idea more? And so with that, we were able to push through this batch lot program. Now, obviously, MCRSA doesn't allow for that. We gotta do plant tags this season, but we created a baseline of communication. We had a discussion, and I was able to really draw a line in the sand between what I have to tell you and what I get to keep as my own, for my own, my own techniques and whatnot. And we're still doing that at the farm. I just had the Ag Department out to our property last Friday because we've already, we're doing plant tags on our plants that are in the ground right now in anticipation of next year. 
And that's a big part of this conversation and a big part of the talk about it, be about it, of this whole movement. And this is the scary part that you guys are involved in. You know, I, after hearing everything I heard today, and especially from the attorney panel, like, wow, it's hard for me to say you should all be showing up at meetings and say, this is my address, come on over, let's talk about it. Because I don't think it's as receptive as, you know, uh, it could be. But when you start doing these practices on your own, taking in this information, tracking, creating your own logs, creating your own operating procedures, it helps build your confidence. So when you do have that conversation with that person, you can have conviction behind what you're saying because you're backed by actual provable facts. And that's really the key here I'm seeing, I've been seeing over the last couple of years of this movement is we are, and I always think about Casey O'Neill down at Happy Day Farms, you know, he, he first starts coming out being a spokesperson for CGA and he starts getting a lot of backlash for it. And, and I was talking to him about this. I said, well, look, we are no longer in a mother may I industry. We have regulations. Now we can own this, take responsibility for it. We have a right to do this and we have a right to do it correctly. So we've got to change our heads, change our headspace and not be as scared. And the reason waterboard enrollment got driven so hard and fast up in Humboldt County was because that became our first line of defense from the Sheriff's Department. Sheriff's Department was going from property to property up in these high impact watersheds and they were going with a DFW agent so they could get authority to go in through the open spaces to go in without a warrant and go in and check out the properties. And I know about one story where they were going up to a property, the DFW agent says, wait a minute, this one, they actually have a water permit with us. I will not be going onto this property with you. And the sheriff's like, well, wait a minute. We, we, we've seen the aerial photos. We want to go in here. We're going to go chop it all down. He says, well, you can go, but I'm not going with you. And they're like, all right, fine. Next property, and they went up the line. So I think that's why you saw the waterboard enrollment drive so hard and fast in Humboldt, is because that drew a line in the sand. And from that line, we were able to start showing how we use our water, get people in the permitting, start building our binders, and start building that communication. And now it's come full circle. You know, this last summer, all I had was my application in with the county, not even, a, not even my affidavit yet. And... Um, a CHP officer comes driving up my road, and we're like, we're off in farmland a good eight miles from the freeway. I thought that was pretty interesting that he's showing up in mid-September. And he comes up, and we just started chatting, you know, just off the cuff, and he was pretty friendly. And he's like, oh, you got a pretty nice little operation here. I was like, yeah, you know, I'm working with the county. We're going through the permit program. He's like, well, you know, I was just driving around. just thought I'd say hi, but you guys have a great day. Everything looks really good. I'll see you later. That was a scary and positive moment at the same time, but very empowering at the end of the day. And that's why I have no problem being very outspoken with everything right now. Awesome. Um, I feel like the biggest benefit is going to come from you guys asking questions and whatnot. I have more for them, but at this point, I want to yield and hear. Yes, sir. Yeah, like where we live, you know, you talk about the Well, we heard through the grapevine that next year what he wants to do is get male plant pollen, marijuana plant pollen, and pass it throughout our area. So now we have to find a, a witness on the guy, and this, we got to issue a cease and desist to him to get him to stop his reactionary behavior. So, first of all, you so probably. What is our organization, how is our organization going to help us with these kinds of people? So, let me just say right now, there is no legal or statutory authority to prevent somebody from broadcasting pollen or planting male plants. So, nothing. But secondly, um, the most important rule of doing this work or any work, in my opinion, like really just being a human, is talk to people, not about them. 
And so, yeah, it's probably terrifying to go knock on the neighbor's door and be like, hey, I hear you've got a problem. What's up? I don't know if you've taken that step yet. I don't know where it'll land you. I've definitely had plants cut because I approached the neighbors, but seven years later, we've got permits. And, you know, this doesn't happen easily. Civil disobedience and social change don't happen because we shy away from the difficult conversations. And so, you know, the only advice I can give is if you've got a problem neighbor, go knock on their door. Talk to them directly. Ask them what their problem is. Ask them why. Um, and, you know, it may be that there's not enough setbacks. It may be that there is a legitimate concern. Maybe not. But make them defend it personally to you. Human-to-human -human interaction is a very powerful thing. Do you guys have thoughts on the question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know if you should share a same road, but road associations are a good place to really start airing this out. Um, I fully agree with Hezekiah. I myself have gone to neighbors. I've helped people go to their neighbors. Um, it actually seems to work most of the time. And, you know, ironically enough, Humboldt County, now that we have an ordinance, we have permits going through, kind of working on that. Um, but we, you know, that we've drawn a line, like, are you in, or are you out? We're starting to see something very, very different. And I think this might actually lend to what you're trying to do right now is that we're watching the regulated or about to be regulated community start pivoting against those who are unregulated because those who are unregulated are impacting our watersheds, impacting our roads, bringing unfriendly people into our neighborhoods. And so all of a sudden there's been this big shift in our community of, of who's doing the right thing and who's not doing the right thing. And I think it might be a really good talking point to bring to your said neighbor and be like, I fully intend to comply should there be rules. And at that point, if people are not complying, I'm there with you. And it, it, I cannot tell you the strange bedfellows that we have right now because we're doing the right thing. And those include some of the most conservative, good old boys that I've ever met. And they, I like their music, totally do, but we all of a sudden like, like the same idea of regulation too. And honestly, to the most hardcore environmentalists, well, the middle ground environmentalists right now. Um, I'm watching both those groups come together and with industry moving forward. So that might be a good conversation for him. Oh, one more point on that. Um, I keep both kinds of beer in my fridge, Bud Light and Coors Light, depending on who I'm talking to. And I invite them over to my house and we sit on my porch. And when we talk about these community groups, one thing we've been doing up at you know, our property since day one is we do little neighborhood workshops. So, you know, uh, when we were first working on the ordinance stuff, I knew hot water was gonna be the hot, the hot button issue. So I invited a bunch of water consultants over and invited all my neighbors over so we could all talk about it. Now, it wasn't cannabis specifically focused. It was focused on our watershed and our neighborly community. And obviously it went down the road, but the point was getting them together, you know, and that's why I always talk about the talks on my front porch because when you get your neighbor face to face and the two of you are actually discussing your issues, you realize that whatever it was that got blown out of proportion that makes them want to grow a bunch of male plants is something so old and minute that it really has no bearing. And, you know, obviously Tara and I know up in Humboldt, we got, we're trying to bring all these different hill groups together and there are grudges that go back so damn long. And this goes back to your, you know, old Hatfield McCoy kind of stuff. Literally and... a bolt on a wheelbarrow. <laughs> One of my neighbors was still mad about the bolt on the wheelbarrow that went missing in 1977. Like, no joke. That is one of the things we had to address in 2011. Um, not to throw... And, and, you know, that's also to put into context, like, this goes way, way back in our communities. And guess what? So... This same shadow of prohibition that prevented the grower from being able to work with mainstream resource, like law enforcement, et cetera, that, that, that shadow also clouded good neighborship. Good neighbors were hard to come by when folks were on the wrong side of the cultural divide there. And we can't actually address the policy until we take the cultural divide head on. And so who knows? Like Nate said, there might be something that goes way back. It might have nothing to do with you. You never know. And maybe this person is just a prohibitionist. There are those too. There are folks that are just entrenched in their ideology. 
but you have to drill into those tough spots. And I tell you what, you can do all the feel good dancing around preaching to the choir, but to make progress, it involves going to the, you know, you got to get to the core of where the other side is. Like back in 2010, before anyone else in the whole wide world would admit publicly that they were a grower, I would come home from most days and collapse in tears and stress. I mean, like horrible, like, not to get overly graphic, but like three days a week, I would throw up blood from ulcers and stress. Like 2010 was a dark, dark time for the few of us that were out. Um, we're not there anymore. Go knock on their door and talk to them. And like, frankly, call me. We'll make a day of it. I don't care. I love talking to everybody about this stuff. Question? Yeah, like, or you're, yeah, like, you got to talk to these people. riot outreach meetings yeah so that was friday Lots night for me that was friday night yeah i i went to spend an evening with six women in the matol valley and there were tears before 10 minutes it was i mean this is the reality um humboldt county and i don't know about here so i'm just going to give again the humboldt perspective um we've been entrenched in cannabis cultivation for 40 plus years and as mentioned before a lot of these parcels and gardens are on very rural areas with um, very sensitive watersheds and habitats. And we built our hippie dwellings that I grew up in and I love. But um, it's tough, I'm not gonna lie. It's, it's really a complicated situation. Um, we embedded into our ordinance that you did not have to permit your home. However, per the water board's order, which is different than your water board order, we do need to have a regulated septic on site. And so that's starting to kind of water cascade down on some of these other issues. This goes back to why we only have 19 permits right now. Um, this is not easy up north. This is expensive and um, I don't really know what to say other than, you know, just start now as much as you can. That face, expense, that, that's a Friday night face, yes. And that ties into, I think, a broader goal, which goes back to something Nate said a little bit earlier, and I think an underlying theme this isn't a cut and paste solution, but there's some cultural attributes you can take away. Read the record keeping section of the CDFA regs and keep records. This year now, have every single one of those record keeping binders on site. Know what it is that you're going to need to record. I know if you go to court, all that shit's evident. Stuff is evidence. That's exactly what I was raised not to do, but I was also raised to be an outlaw farmer. And that's not what our aspirations are anymore. And so, you know, you gotta, you gotta make that, that difficult decision. Um, you guys don't have, to the best of my understanding, one of the more important tools in Humboldt and Mendocino. Humboldt has the alternate owner builder home. Mendocino has Schedule K. To the best of my understanding, Nevada County does not have an affiliate program. This is a much, or an analog program, sorry. This is a much larger topic with regard to the right to build a home and how extensive property rights are. And so essentially in Humboldt and Mendocino, the, pro the program is quite similar. If you are building your home to be your primary residence for your family and you own the property and you agree not to sell the house for five years minimum, then there's a very streamlined permitting program. This is something that when you start looking at public policy as a broader sort of holistic landscape level approach, this was one of the early iterations. Pot growers and timber people, managed, libertarian timber people in Humboldt managed to find a bridge across the cultural divide in really 83, 87 is when this program was developed. And so there are these sort of one-off things that will occasionally align different factions within the community. It wasn't cannabis related at the time. It is proving to be a very important pathway for Canada, and certainly Mendocino. I mean, the, the Schedule K homes in Mendocino, pretty much every one of our members that are getting permitted in Mendocino are on one of these Schedule K permits. So there's, uh, it's the Alternate Owner Builder Program, and those ordinances are pretty well tested. There's um, 14 counties in the state, uh, if, I, if I remember correctly, that have some sort of a similar program. Um, so you guys might look outside of cannabis policy at that as a potential fix to rural home building in general. Yeah. Yeah. 
I'm. So that there you go. You guys had a yeah. I thought yours was I thought yours was applied more on an amnesty. I, it, I didn't ever think that Nevada County had a standing permit program. I could be wrong. Yeah. Doesn't really matter to Scott. Yeah, I knew it wasn't in my analysis what we said. Um, let's jump over here, then we'll jump back over here. Talk about the RR program. Yeah, uh, there, yeah. I think there's a couple, a couple things that would really lend to your effort on on that, uh, or at least dovetail into that. And one is a centralized processing. Two is an RRR program, and three is pre-existing versus new. And so I'm going to explain all those. Um, so <laughs> centralized processing. You agree? Yeah. Yeah. So centralized processing, meaning that your uh, county would then, um, such as ours permit a process center where you can bring your product to to be trimmed or whatever else needs to happen in that process to take the activity of trimming off of your property that will reduce your compliance costs um, as far as hosting and housing trimmers so um, tangent you sure. need to keep growing your crop you want to trim it on site and that's even debatable maybe we don't even want to but that's an example of wanting okay. um in, in our county, we have what we call the RRR program, which is Retire, Remediate, and Relocate. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into the technical aspects of that, but the concept and intent is that if a property does not comply, then you're able to move that square footage to another property that does. Um, I'm, the details I don't want to go into because it's, it's not quite working as well as we wanted it right now because we designated those other farms to be a specific soil type. And so we've consolidated a shit ton of weed on a very, very specific place, and it's really made a lot of people mad. Sorry, I cussed again. Sorry. Um, the other one is uh, pre-existing versus new, and we were really, really specific with our county what constituted a pre-existing farm and what would become a new farm, and they were very... Um, open to discussing how that worked, and I think it's really been very progressive in, in moving this forward. Um, as far as how that really ties into the permitting thing that goes back to then your activity and your centralized processing. So there is a little little policy wonk on you, but um, I'm happy to talk more about that at any time. Uh, a little bit more to that. Um, so our, our farm was a pre-existing farm, right? And um, we're in a zoned ag exclusive, all the, all the fun bells and whistles that we needed for the county permit. <coughs> but I have multiple buildings on our property. And some of these buildings go back over 100 years. And the idea of me having to have every single building up to perfect code for a 2,500 square foot permit? No, forget about it. So the approach that we've taken on this and this is something that you know we'll see but this I just want to put this in your heads um, the difference between parcel and premises you know we have uh, we're dealing down in the Ferndale area we're dealing with some properties that are like 500 acres giant ranch land and they want to put like a couple different grows on the property well if you have the entire parcel in the permit program you have to have everything on that entire place up to code. What we did on ours is we narrowly defined exactly where cultivation activities occur. 
And we make sure that everything within that zone helps us move forward right now under our existing permit rules and allows for us to have the flexibility. Now that we have the state rules that just came out on Friday, I got to go back and look at everything and see how it messes up. But gives us the ability to keep operating now, move forward and anticipate the needs to come. You know, under my permit, I have a bunch of conditions that I have a year to fulfill. One of those is getting my buildings all up to code and dealing with this whole workers, ADA, bathroom, you know, septic, all that stuff. I was able to get to the point where I got this piece of paper right here because I said I have a plan for moving forward. I agree I'm going to be in compliance. I've narrowly defined where the cultivation activity occurs on my property. Give me a stamp and let's go for it. So they've given me a year. It might take us two years. We'll see. But at least, you know, the bot we're looking at baby steps here. What can we do now? How do we keep operating now? How do we protect ourselves now? But also see what's coming, understand where we're going, and budget for that. We are no longer in this, um, I mean, I, I, always, I used to do uh, indoor grows a lot back in the old days in the county. And we always judged the value of that on a three-round return on investment, Right. How much does it cost to get it up and running within three rounds? It should be fully paying for itself. Well, now I'm looking at our farm as a three-year ROI because we don't even know what the rules are and how many more hoops we got to jump through. So we got to take a longer view and start looking at what can we do now, what do we need to do later, and what do we want to do in the future. Look at that. I brought it back. I brought it back. <laughs> Well, no, there, te there technically is a, a freeze on if you didn't sign up, then you cannot sign up until a completed environmental impact report is done. Now, there's a traffic jam in if you did sign up actually getting through the process right now. And so there's kind of two different courts, and it depends on if you decided you wanted to move forward by December 30th of last year, or if you're sitting still in the shadows right now and contemplating if you want to go forward. They submitted their application and the county is not processing those applications yeah. as quickly as they're in line. Go. Yeah. Then there's another 8,000 who didn't sign up. sign up that are still out there in the who knows what. And, and I do want to just, like, I pointed out the difference in land mass here because people oftentimes go, oh, Humboldt, it's so huge. Per capita and per square mile, it's pretty similar. It's just a really, really big county. Um, you guys do have, I, you have some unique population challenges here. Nothing like Placer County, though. So be thankful. It takes you're not Placer. From one corner to the next corner is about six hour drive. Um, Rachel's ready to shut us down, but if there's any last burning questions, I know we have some socializing time afterwards, so we can do this a little bit more informally, even though this has been about the epitome of informal. Um, questions? Comments? Thank you. Yes. Oh, we've got two more. We're just going to take two more. Just two. Um, so, when we went through the permitting process, um, what, what areas... I think the, um, the biggest hurdle that I luckily saw coming was the story I told to the planning department and the county from the beginning. Everybody, and I've been dealing with this lately a lot with people in our community, you know, they're like, okay, I just want to do a 10,000 square foot new operation, da, da, da. I'm like, oh, sweet. Now let's, now let's send out our water guys. Let's go have a look. Oh. So wait, you have an acre of an existing grow that's on a huge slope and you're stealing water and all this. Okay, you told the wrong story at the beginning and now you can't back up your story and now you're going nowhere. So really the key I, I'm thinking here and the thing that helped us get to where we are was 
kind of mapping out your whole story beginning to end. And I do, I call it phases. I have phased approach. You know, phase one is my existing, phase two is my fixes under the rules, and phase three is what I want to be, right? Um, but the biggest hurdles I dealt with are all the different agencies involved and the timelines. Everyone has a different timeline. And the biggest problem we were dealing with with the logjam and Humble is. If I want the building department to come and look at my greenhouse, well, they won't give me a building permit until I get my county permit, until I get this one. And then I can't get my county one until I get my water stuff in order. And that's why I think the most important thing right here, right now, is get your water rights, uh, your discharge waiver, and your storage, and your 1600 or whatever it is, those three things, water rights, water storage, and water discharge, in perfect order and make sure they help tell your story because that's your proof and that's where you get these agencies who back your play and then it gets really easy when you're dealing with the county because they love to defer to somebody else's authority when they give you something on a piece of paper and so you might as well pick the big dogs who have come out the state water board and the regional water boards who have given us a nice clean path to move forward to make clean water right so Really jump on that. I mean, that was the thing that we did first on our property, is we jumped straight into the water issues, got those nicely mapped out, and used that as our roadmap for what we could do potentially on the property. So if I was gonna say anything you need to be doing now is work with those people, get that stuff in order, and that's gonna help you write the story. And everything else will come from there. And, you know, so I, like I said earlier, I'm big into very simple, you know, slogans. and. My slogan in doing this work is, we have to tell the truth even if it doesn't make us look good. And when we tell the truth about who we are as a community, the impacts we're having as a community, if there's a part that makes us squirm, we need to fix it. But it all starts with telling the truth. Shine the light, in, in, in my opinion, in the counties that we've been successful in, it's because we daylighted the problems first. I said public safety crisis, environmental crisis, more times than law enforcement and more times than the environmentalists. And because of that, we had jurisdiction in those topic areas because I said, you know what, you're right. There is an environmental challenge. Here's the truth. There is a public safety challenge here. And so tell the truth. Even if it doesn't make our community look good, doesn't make us feel good, you're going to find more common ground because you're going to disarm the 1960s country music listening prohibitionists by taking it from them so you can have an actual conversation about solutions because well, that's what we're doing is solving things. I know. There's I mean, nothing I, wrong with 60s country and music. And trust me, I've, I've taken, I've taken, you know, physical and, blows over. And this now you, and you have one thing in common. Now so you have one thing in common. You got the last one there. Bring an album. I'll bring my GoPro when I There you go. You should have brought it today. Last question. Bring us home. No. I think you make a good point, actually. Consultants. I, I'm going to go on a, mi a mini consultant rant right now. Here's some advice for a community who's about to engage with consultants. Make, ask them questions before you hire them. How long have you been in this field? Do you have re uh, any resumes that I can see? What, what makes you an expert in this? Before going to the immediate first knee jerk, how much do you cost? Are you cheap? Because I'm watching in my community consultants, consultants, who are kind of the cheapest route end up being the most expensive route because the advice that you're paying for isn't actually backed by experience. So there, there's something to take away from this. If you take away anything, please. Yeah. You don't have to be the lawyer, but you gotta do your due diligence before you hire one, for sure. Yeah, that, I'm not gonna talk about, I'm not gonna talk about the consultants. <laughs> hey, thank you so much for coming today. Thank, thanks to these two speakers, Karen. So I hope you guys can stick around for a little bit. We're just going to do a little happy hour. There's beer for sale in the back. There's still more snacks. And otherwise, we're going to have our next workshop, um, I think it's June 12th, which is the second Tuesday of June at the Holbrook. So I hope you'll join us then and get the word out to your friends if you're not able to make it.
make it. What time? I think it starts at. I think it starts at like 6 p.m. Four to six. June 13th. All right, second Tuesday. Four o'clock. Four o'clock. Yes, thank you. Of forest forest management. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of questions around the Hey, um, so I I know from absolute from like experience that this can be really, really scary. And you know, one of the things that I've really resonated with, one of my consistent meditations is that courage is not the absence of fear, and it doesn't mean you don't feel the fear. It means that you stay focused and see clearly what the end goal is in spite of the fear. And so this is terrifying. I mean, I got, like, they chopped down a thousand plants on a parcel that was in my name a week before I was on a panel in front of a Senate Joint Committee with the sheriff who did the chopping. I used satellite imagery of the farm in my presentation and made the him squirm just as, it's terrifying. <laughs> This is scary stuff. There's no way to soften that. Stay focused. Make clear decisions in spite of that feeling. It's really the only way to get to where we're going. That's all. Thank you.